Hello and welcome to the theater. I am Karina Bachelor, the resident dramaturg here at Gable Stage. Today, I am excited to give this talk on A Doll's House, Then and Now. I'd like to begin this talk by introducing our playwrights, Henrik Ibsen and Lucas Nath. Ibsen is the playwright responsible for the original A Doll's House, the play from which Lucas Nath's play stems. Nath's A Doll's House Part Two is both a continuation and a contemporary interpretation of the challenges that exist within human relationships. Lucas Nath, a native Floridian, was inspired by the questions left unanswered in Ibsen's original play. Specifically, what happened to Nora after she left her husband and children? In A Doll's House Part 2, Nath wanted to examine the dynamics of the relationships between Nora and the other characters in the play, and how they have changed since Nora's departure. By juxtaposing period dress with modern language, Nate's play adds a contemporary spin to the original work, bringing attention to the ongoing struggle for women's rights and equality. The play challenges the audience to consider what has changed and what has remained the same in society's attitudes towards women and their role in the home and society. When Lucas Nath was writing A Doll's House Part 2, he asked actors what they thought Nora's outcome would be after she left Torvald. Most of them thought she'd have very few options as a divorced woman in 1879. Most even thought she would end up a prostitute, destitute, or dead. So Lucas wanted to go in the opposite direction and make sure she was successful. In 2014, even Academy Award-winning film, television, and theater producer Scott Rudden took notice of Nate's writing after reading a draft of A Doll's House Part Two. Thanks to Rudden, the play received a Broadway premiere, circumventing the usual route of regional production to off-Broadway production to eventually a Broadway production. Nate's star-like sheen is hardly dimming, According to American Theatre, he was one of the top 20 most produced playwrights of 2022 and has topped the list for the last few years. He has won most of the prestigious writing prizes, including the Outer Critics Circle Award for Best New Play, Obie Award for Playwriting, Steinberg Playwright Award, and he's also a Guggenheim Fellow. Nate's plays range in themes from a spiritual crisis within an evangelical congregation to the unequal power dynamic between the sexes. Yet, throughout his disparate plays, there remains a theatrical enacting of contradictory and uncomfortable ideas wrestling with each other in a forum-like space we call the theater. A space where we practice asking questions and listening to, at times, difficult responses, share our different perspectives, and take pleasure in confronting unresolvable questions that thought-provoking plays pose. Now we move on to Ibsen, who was a Norwegian playwright that lived from 1828 to 1906. He is often referred to as the father of modern drama for his role in paving the way for the theatrical innovations of the 20th century. Ibsen was writing at a time when the acting style was incredibly stylized. The goal was not to perform the text authentically and realistically, but instead to perform it beautifully. Many of the plays were written with this style in mind and included verse and heightened language. Sets were also very different to what we are accustomed to and were largely painted backdrops. The idea of watching realistic three-dimensional characters from the middle class, no less, would have been anathema to theater goers in the 1800s. With the beginning of the industrial period, there were many changes, including scientific and technological advances, as well as thought and social reform. Ibsen took notice of the changes and sought to address these contemporary issues in his plays. And this is what sets him apart from his contemporaries. 
He aimed to bring the complexities of contemporary life onto the stage, and his plays often dealt with taboo topics such as adultery, suicide, and insanity. He sought to represent characters as they were in real life, without fancy theatrical accoutrements like verse and heightened language. Instead, his characters spoke in natural rhythms and at times even interrupted each other as we are wont to do naturally. He also used this play as a vehicle for social and political commentary, challenging the prevailing societal norms and conventions of his time. In 2006, which marked the centenary of Ibsen's death, A Doll's House was recognized as the most widely performed play in the world for that year. This is an autograph manuscript of A Doll's House by Ibsen that was included in the Memory of the World Register by UNESCO in 2001 in acknowledgement of its historical importance. The Memory of the World program is an international initiative launched by the United Nations. The program aims to preserve and provide universal access to the world's documentary heritage. So what was it about Ibsen's A Doll's House that interested Lucas Neith? What was it about and why is it so important? A Doll's House was first published in 1879 and has since become one of the most renowned works of modern theater. The play is a powerful commentary on the societal norms of 19th century Norway and the role of women in marriage and society. At the center of the play is the character of Nora Helmer, a wife and mother who is trapped in a restrictive marriage and bound by the legal and social systems of 1900s Europe. The play explores the consequences of her attempts to break free from these constraints and assert her individuality. One of the defining features of A Doll's House is its depiction of Nora's awakening. Over the course of the play, she realizes that her life has been a mere performance when she tells Torvald in the final scene, Our home has been nothing but a playroom. I have been your doll wife. She then makes the difficult decision to leave her husband and children in pursuit of self-discovery. Nora again. I believe that before anything else, I'm a human being, just as much as you are. Or at any rate, I shall try to become one. I know quite well that most people would agree with you, Torvald, and that you have warrant for it in books. But I can't be satisfied any longer with what most people say and with what's in books. I must think things out for myself and try to understand them. The play's themes of feminism and individualism continue to be relevant today. It remains a powerful and thought-provoking work that challenges traditional gender roles and encourages its audience to question their own assumptions and beliefs. This is a painting of the original production at the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen on December 21st, 1879. Let's continue with a brief summary of Ibsen's A Doll's House. A Doll's House opens with Nora Helmer returning from a Christmas shopping trip. She is excited to show her husband Torvald the gifts she has purchased for their children and to talk about their upcoming holiday. We then meet Nora's friend, Mrs. Christine Linda, who has arrived in town looking for work. Nora confides in Mrs. Linda that, unbeknownst to Torvald, she has borrowed money to pay for a trip that saved his life. Nora's loan becomes a central issue in the play when Krogstad, the man who loaned Nora the money, arrives at the Helmer household. Krogstad threatens to reveal Nora's secret loan to Torvald, which would ruin his reputation and career. Nora pleads with Krogstad not to reveal her secret, but he refuses unless she can persuade Torvald to keep him employed at the bank. He adds that he can prove that Nora forged her father's signature on the loan. Here is Nora played by Vera Komizar Shevskaya, one of the most celebrated actresses and theater managers in 19th century Russia, as she dresses the Christmas tree in a 1904 production. 
In act two, it's Christmas day and Nora finds herself worrying about her future. The Helmers are due to attend a costume party and Mrs. Linda has agreed to help Nora with her costume. Nora will be dressing up as an Italian fisher girl who dances the Tarantella. Nora tries once again to convince Torvald to re-employ Krogstad. Unfortunately, Torvald has already offered Krogstad's job to Mrs. Linda and is unwilling to keep him employed. Nora's request only angers Torvald and prompts him to send out Krogstad's notice immediately. After Krogstad learns that Nora has not been able to convince Torvald to re-employ him, he leaves a letter detailing Nora's forgery and debt in Torvald's locked letterbox. Mrs. Linda then arrives and Nora tells her all about Krogstad's letter and how she had no choice but to forge her father's signature on the loan as her father was on his deathbed at the time. Mrs. Linda shares that she and Krogstad used to be in love and that she would go to Krogstad's home to try to convince him to take back the letter and deny the accusations. Here, Nora practices the Tarantella for Torvald in Igmar Bergman's adaptation of A Doll's House called Nora. According to Bergman, it is Helmer who is the victim of Nora's aggression and brutality. I see Torvald Helmer as a very nice guy. Very responsible, Bergman said in 1981, the year his A Doll's House adaptation made its debut. Ibsen's play, he added, quote, is really the tragedy of Torvald Helmer." Unquote. In the final act, after reading the letter from Krogstad, Torvald accuses Nora of ruining his life and tells her she can no longer raise his children, although she would be able to live with them to keep up appearances. At that point, a maid appears with a note from Krogstad saying that all has been forgiven and even includes the forged document. Nora's confrontation with Torvald leads her to realize that her marriage is not based on love and equality, but rather on a patronizing and unequal relationship. She decides to leave her husband and children, telling him that she needs to find out who she really is. The play ends with the sound of the slam of the front door as Nora exits, and Torvald is left to ponder the implications of her decision. Here, Nora is slamming the door in a doll's house at Iowa stage, in the door slam heard round the world. In one of the most famous and pivotal moments in the play, Nora performs the Tarantella dance. The Tarantella, also known as the Dance of the Spider, is a high-spirited Southern Italian folk dance. The word Tarantella comes from Tarantism, a hysterical condition that was thought to be caused by the bite of a tarantula. After being bitten by the spider, the victim would begin to dance convulsively and enter a state of delirium where she would contort her body as if she was possessed. The feminist critic Catherine Clement declares that for Nora, the dance serves as a form of hysterical catharsis, permitting her to escape temporarily into a free, lawless world of music and uninhibited movement. Now we will delve into Nora Helmer's world, late 1800s Europe and more specifically Norway. The history of divorce in Norway has evolved over the centuries, reflecting changes in social attitudes, legal systems and religious beliefs. Before the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, divorce was not recognized by the Catholic Church which had a significant influence on Norwegian society at the time. However, there were some limited cases where couples were granted annulment or separation by church authorities. During the 1600s, the Lutheran Church gained influence in Norway and divorce was permitted in cases of infidelity, impotence, or desertio, when one partner leaves or disappears. However, it was still relatively rare and the process was complicated and expensive. Here is Martin Luther and his 95 theses posted to the door where he condemned the excesses and corruption of the Roman Catholic Church at Wittenberg Church Castle in Germany. 
In the late 18th century, the Danish-Norwegian king Frederick II decided that granting divorce was something he would be happy to do. Between 15 to 20 couples were granted a divorce each year in Norway from 1790 to 1814 before the number started to fall. This all changed from about 1814 when the Dano-Norwegian Union ended and it became difficult to obtain a divorce once again. Figures suggest that about seven couples were divorced each year in the late 1800s. In 1879, Ibsen writes A Doll's House, reflecting the change in attitudes towards divorce seen and felt throughout Norway and Europe as women's rights movements gathered steam. Divorce was made more accessible through legal reforms and the grounds for divorce were expanded to include cruelty, insanity, and incompatibility. These changes were part of a broader movement towards individual rights and the recognition of women's legal and social equality. In 1909, the Norwegian Divorce Act was passed and many legal grounds were recognized as valid reasons for divorce. Either partner could apply for divorce as long as they had been separated for over a year. The 20th century saw further reforms to Norway's divorce laws, including the introduction of a no-fault system in 1978. This meant that divorce could be granted without either party having to prove fault or wrongdoing. Today, Norway has one of the highest divorce rates in the world. In 2020, there were over 7,000 divorces in the country, representing a divorce rate of 2.7 per 1,000 inhabitants. Let's take a look now at what marriage and education would have been like for the Noras of the world in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In the 19th century, the institution of marriage was highly valued and seen as a necessity for both men and women. For women, marriage was often considered to be the only acceptable path in life, and it was seen as a means of securing financial stability and social status. For men, marriage was seen as a way to establish a household and have children, and was often linked to their identity as providers and protectors. Despite some advances in women's education during the century, such as the establishment of women's colleges and the growth of female literacy, women still face significant barriers. Many believe that educating women beyond basic reading and writing skills was unnecessary and even harmful as it was thought that women's intellectual pursuits would interfere with their traditional roles as wives and mothers. On the left, we have a book by Dr. Eugene Becklerd, who was a French physiologist. He wrote guides for single individuals and newlyweds in an effort to eliminate confusion and issues related to conception and other health problems faced by young people. In this book, the Marriage Guide, Dr. Becklerd states that conception cannot occur in feelings of horror or disgust. Hence, no woman ever became pregnant from a rape committed on her against her inclination. What sets Dr. Beckler apart even more than his medical insights are his beliefs about women. He states that the ultimate purpose of a woman's life is to get married which was in line with the widely held views of the time and likely struck a chord with those who read his works. As a result of these cultural norms and values, marriage and education were often seen as mutually exclusive for women in the 19th century. Women who pursued education were sometimes viewed as being unmarriageable and were considered to be sacrificing their chances of finding a husband and establishing a family. Nevertheless, despite these challenges, a small but growing number of women were able to break free from these constraints and pursue both marriage and education. Here is an anti-feminist postcard from the early 1900s with advice for young husbands by one who's been through it. The advice included don't flirt with other girls when the wife is looking. Don't pop out to see a man about a dog more than 12 times in a single day. And lastly, don't let your wife become a suffragette or there are bad times in store for you. 
While marriage was something all women were expected to do in the 19th century, having sex, on the other hand, was not, unless it was for the purposes of procreation. Societal attitudes towards women's sexuality were generally conservative and restricted. Women were expected to adhere to strict moral codes and to maintain their virginity until marriage. To exhibit sexual desire and behavior was considered scandalous, and women who deviated from this norm were stigmatized and subjected to shame and moral condemnation. Renowned scientists and doctors often viewed women's sexual drives and their sexual organs with fear and anxiety. A woman's sexuality was considered a source of moral panic and medicalized. There was a widespread belief that women's sexual desires and behaviors could lead to hysteria, a medical condition that was diagnosed frequently and treated as a mental disorder. The clitoris in particular was considered a source of abnormal sexual desire and was often regarded as a dangerous and shameful part of the female anatomy. Renowned Italian criminologists Cesare Lombroso and Guillermo Ferrero believed that women were naturally frigid and that large clitorises were the marks of prostitutes and the sexually perverted. Women who were believed to have engaged in unnatural sexual behaviors, such as masturbation, were subjected to surgical treatments, such as clitoridectomy, to curb their desires. Historians frequently refer to a famous book from the Victorian era, which was written by the prominent gynecologist Dr. William Acton in 1857, titled The Functions and Disorders of the Reproductive Organs in Childhood, Youth, Adult Age, and Advanced Life, considered in the physiological, social, and moral relations. In the book, Acton made the statement that the majority of women, fortunately for them, are not much troubled with sexual feeling of any kind. Dr. William Acton once more, the best mothers, wives, and managers of households know little of sexual indulgences. Love of home, children, and domestic duties are the only passions they feel. These domestic duties that Dr. William Acton refers to fall in line with the idea of separate spheres, a concept popular in the mid to late 19th century and early 20th century, which referred to the belief that men and women had different and distinct roles and responsibilities within society. With men being seen as the providers and leaders in the public sphere and women being relegated to the private sphere of the home and family. This idea was widely accepted and was used to justify the limited opportunities for women in education, politics, and the workplace. The separate spheres concept also influenced gender norms and expectations, shaping how both women and men were supposed to behave and think. The popular image of the ideal wife or woman came to be known as the angel in the house, based on the title of the popular Victorian poem by Coventry Patmore, where he describes his angel wife as a paragon of meekness, devotion, and purity. She leans and weeps against his breast and seems to think the sin was hers or any eye to see her charms at any time she's still his wife, dearly devoted to his arms. She loves with love that cannot tire. I'd like to end this talk. I'd like to end this talk by exploring the timelessness of both Ibsen's A Doll's House and Nate's A Doll's House Part Two. The timelessness of Henrik Ibsen's plays is a testament to the enduring themes and issues that he explored in his works. Ibsen's plays tackle a wide range of topics, including gender roles, social norms, morality, and individual freedom that continue to resonate with today's audiences. There's no denying Ibsen's reach is far and wide. In fact, in 1920s China and Japan, emancipated women were referred to as noras, 
And when the Chinese Communist Government Party newspaper released a list of 50 foreigners who had contributed in shaping modern China's development, it included only one playwright, Henrik Ibsen. Ibsen's plays are notable for their focus on strong, complex female characters who are often ahead of their time in terms of their independence, ambition, and questioning of traditional gender roles. As the esteemed theater critic Michael Feingold wisely stated, for this was Ibsen's great discovery. He perceived not only that the personal is political, as we all know now, but that this realization could be drama's driving force. While Ibsen's inheritance is keenly felt in A Doll's House Part Two, it is fused with Nade's combination of innovation and intellectual inquiry. In A Doll's House Part Two, Nath updates the original work for a contemporary audience, bringing attention to ongoing issues related to women's rights and equality. Through the lens of Nora's story, Nate's play critiques the societal norms and conventions that limit women's choices and opportunities, offering a mirror to Ibsen's own play, while also asking us how much has changed or stayed the same between 1879 and 2023, nearly 150 years later. Thank you and enjoy the show.